Harold Davis. I'm here to teach you about the art and craft of digital photography. everyone and welcome to the Harold Davis studio in Berkeley, California. We are so pleased to have you with us today. Today's webinar is processing black and white landscape and architecture. In this detailed presentation, Harold Davis explains overall best practices for a digital black and white workflow. Harold will explain a variety of monochromatic conversion techniques, strategies for putting all these techniques together in a single image with pinpoint control over different areas will be explained. This presentation will particularly emphasize landscape and architectural photography. Many of you know who Harold is, but if you're joining us for the first time today, here's a bit about Harold. Harold Davis is an artist, photographer, and author. His most recent books include Creative Black and White, Second Edition, and Creative Garden Photography, both published by Rocky Nook. Harold is the developer of a unique technique for photographing flowers for transparency and an innovator of digital multi-raw processing and hand HDR processing. Harold is an internationally known photographer. His prints are widely collected and he is a sought after workshop leader. He is a Moab master and a Zeiss ambassador. Harold's website is digitalfieldguide.com. Now I'm going to stop my share and hand it over to Harold. Hi, Phyllis. Hi, everyone. Uh, so thank you for coming today. I'm, I'm really excited about this webinar. First, I have a presentation to show you with a fair amount of information and hopefully inspiration in it. Then I'm going to work through processing a number of examples. We'll see how many I get through. What I'm also going to do as part of my presentation is make some suggestions, also known as assignments, for what you might want to experiment with for that session two weeks from now in terms of presenting work of your own. Okay, so everybody, let's, uh, let's, turn, let's turn the world to black and white. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, everybody see, uh, see the title slide? Look, looks good to me, but then again, that's me. So, I, I couldn't resist running through some of our black and white books. Here's uh, the most recent one, which is Creative Black and White uh, Digital Photography Tips and Techniques from Rocky Nook. And there's a discount code on it at the back. If you aren't familiar with this book, here's what the table of contents looks like. And it's really divided up into four sections, but three, three significant sections, which are how to think about black and white in a color world, the monochromatic vision. Um, basic processing of black and white, of which there are many ways to go about it. And what happens after a while, I think, is that people develop a favorite workflow and often don't vary too much from that, but that's fine. And then once you have a basic black and white, um, uh, conversion, how do you add special effects to it, like uh, like toning, for example, and there are many others, the pinhole effect and so on. And that's largely going to be the subject of the second workshop on this, on this uh, subject. We're not going to get too far into that today. Here's the book I did for Monticelli Press, which is something like a combination of a coffee table book and a uh, how-to book. And uh, this is a book specifically on monochromatic HDR techniques. It's really a book about black and white photography. And it's my habit to mostly carry a tripod. And when I know that I'm gonna be going to black and white in the end, I uh, do shoot it in HDR. I shoot a, a exposure range of images. So that's why that's an important topic for me. And just to boast a little, here are some of the various foreign translations of my black and white books and I particularly like this one in, in uh, France. So what makes for a black and white vision in a colorful world? Uh, 
one of the things is that you've got a stark contrast. So, uh, so, so I, I look for images where there are skies that are heavy contrast. And I was going to say right at the beginning that in addition to having a pre-visualization of the way the image is going to go, it's great to have a pre-visualization of the way things in the Photoshop darkroom are going to go as well, so that you know what you're processing towards. And when we get to my examples portion of this, I will, I will show some of uh, what I mean by that. Concrete examples. This is a tree in Isuin Gardens in Nara, the imperial capital of Japan before Kyoto was the capital. And note one thing that's a hallmark of the way I tend to process black and white images, and that is that there's some aspects of this that are closer looking to a lithograph or an etching perhaps than a photograph. So I'm not really in my black and white work tending to aim for photorealism. So this is in a heavy snowfall year in Yosemite and with the match of the tree coming up. And as I said in to Connie in Brooklyn, uh, who is waiting for a snowstorm there, snow can make for very nice monochromatic work just because of all the whiteness up against the snow. Another natural landscape feature that helps with black and white is mist and fog, particularly as with this pier in mid coast California in Cayucas, California, where you let the uh, let a long exposure mist out the uh, the the background so that you get this wonderful foggy hazy look. light rays like this coming through the fog in the bridge are also great for black and white. Not bad in color either, but the color and things, something like this, <coughs> can look a little bit garish. And one of the compositional things that I always look for in black and white is the window within a window within a window. Again, an image here under the Aquina Bay Bridge up on the Oregon coast. Um, a image that could almost be a lithograph rather than a photograph. If you look at it, there's a double take. This is a dragon at sunrise in the Ansaparega Desert. And um, there are these sculptures that are near Borrego Springs in the desert, including this dragon. Now, if you were standing where I was standing to make this photograph on this side of the dragon's head at sunrise, and you took one exposure that was more or less uh, right for the sky so you could see the sun rays, what would naturally happen to this side of the dragon's head as a thought experiment? It would be silhouetted. So the and so and and black so the answer to how to photograph something like this is to exposure bracket and use hdr techniques to put back together what you have and more penumbral shadow lighting down on the coast of oregon uh, near cape perpetua so having moody lighting like on this landscape of the coast of Oregon or these or Eureka Dunes and uh, Death Valley National Park is part of what makes for the mystery of black and white, how you can have a part of it that's bright and a part of it that's not. And I think I have uh, the raw file for this image in my uh, in my example, so it's one to work through. Uh, but there it's a stark, there's a starkness to black and white that where you can see the lines going into the composition ending at the horizon line and having a nice flowing sky. One thing that black and white brings out in landscape like this view from Zabriskie Point in Death Valley are patterns. Before I move on to some more conceptual 
aspects of black and white, uh, I did want to show this is this is the set of prints that go into a portfolio that we've developed called monochromatic visions and this these particular ones were recently uh, combined in a portfolio and sold to a collector, which was nice, but the we're also working on a second monochromatic visions portfolio. So in my in my light, I don't really see a black and white photograph or any photograph for that matter, until it's had some kind of life outside of the computer monitor, uh, whether it's printing in a book or printing as a print. So making prints is very important to me in my work. This diagram uh, indicates for me something of the theoretical process that I go through in terms of uh, creating photos, particularly monochromatic photos. So perhaps I have a concept and then I see it and recognize it and I see whether this might work and I go back and rethink it and perhaps I have to plan it. Maybe I need the moon in a certain place or clouds in a certain place. Um, the and so I make the action and then the creating and processing is down the triangle. I, for example, yesterday I was photographing uh, what will probably be monochromatic images of a small uh, flowering jade plant and I made a lot of images and um, and of the hundreds of captures that I made, you know, probably realistically, well, I'll only work on one or two of them, or maybe three, and probably, and maybe I'll make showing it. So editing toward the bottom of this upside down triangle is really one of the very important parts of photography. Photography itself is an act of editing the world around us. And then within our own work, the better we are at editing our work, the better. I mean, I don't want to be showing anyone, I don't want to be showing you my lousy work if I can help it. So to do that, one needs to understand how to recognize good work and bad work. And sometimes it's very hard to separate out one's own work from the emotional experience of having been at the place. Perhaps it was a wonderful experience being there. Uh, Perhaps that led to some nice images, perhaps it didn't, but it's hard to separate the two things. Here's the moon rising through the Bay Bridge in San Francisco Bay. A uh, HDR image of a Vincent motorcycle engine restored. And this one to me is a lot of what the puzzle of monochromatic photography is about. Uh, thought experiment, what are you looking at here? So sometimes I think this would look like a Mount, uh, Chinese landscape painting, but Mark in the uh, chat box has called it out as a beach. And you can see the scale of the thing by the human footprints toward the top of the image, which are tracing right, well, I can't, I can't really, uh, highlight it out. But if you look carefully, you'll see the uh, human footprints at the top of this beach and you can see the surf at the, uh, coming in at the bottom. Um, and uh, Mark, yes, the that image was turned sideways from the way I originally photographed it. And that's one thing that sometimes I will do with images that where the orientation isn't so clear, I will try them sideways or even upside down. I have my camera set so that it actually does not record ro rotation, which is good because when it does record it, it gets it wrong half the time anyhow for me. So um, I, I, I tend to prefer not to automate that kind of thing. This is a photograph from uh, of the rooftops of Paris from one of the no longer existent Notre Dame towers an architectural photograph of the outside of one of Leonardo's domes in, or Leonardo's dome in Pavia, Italy. And yes, this is, uh, this is toned sepia, Tim.
an HDR panorama uh, along the uh, Kimono Kodo pilgrimage trail on the Key Peninsula in Japan. This one's called uh, the uh, the spot is called the view of 10,000 peaks. I can't count for sure whether there were 10,000, but there certainly are a few. And I climbed up there up a sort of gnarly trail with a lot of uh, a, a lot of tree branches along the trail in the pouring rain. And I had an umbrella with me, which I was able to clamp to the tripod, hold over the camera law for long enough to success, successfully make this uh, multi-segmented panorama. James asks, do I use drones? No, I don't. If I were a really young person wanting to get into a field of photography, I might really learn how to do uh, drone photography and get my license for it. And the couple of times that I've played with a drone, um, in particularly in places where it's really the you know really easy and fun to like east of the Sierra, I've really enjoyed it. They're a blast to play with, but hard to control and hard to get good photography, and really annoying where you're when you're somewhere trying to enjoy the serenity of the wilderness and someone's buzzing around with a drone. I mean, get a life. No, okay, ignore me if you love drones. Here's another black and white uh, uh, multi-panel HDR image combined by hand so that the trees have one exposure and the background forest have another, the aspens have one exposure and the backgrounds have, have another. This was near Sonora Pass and the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And again, an average exposure here would create kind of a, a blah image. This is one of my uh, favorite and most popular images from the time I spent photographing Antelope Canyon, which is an incredibly beautiful set of formations, as you all probably know, on Navajo land near Page, Arizona. And unfortunately, it's one of these things where it's become so popular that it's hard to photograph it with any serenity, but it's still, still worth visiting for sure. So I believe that um, digital photography done at a high level is a lot more complex than film photography ever was. Now I'm I'm not I'm not trying to knock the craftsmanship and uh, technique involved in doing fine uh, black and white work, which is really incredible. But to do good. Uh, black and white digital photography, you need to know quite a lot. And some of it has to be about um, uh, technology stuff. And so here's a, here's a uh, skeletal diagram of what a content management system, a CMS for photography might look like. This is more or less what ours looks like. And you need to have something like this. And here's a diagram of a color to black and white workflow. Now, the part of this that's really significant is the raw capture part toward the right of the diagram, which shows how you might go about combining multiple exposures into a, uh, a single black and white image. You know, my, my thoughts about this get so complex at that, and there's so many of them that it's hard to know where to start. But the, the thing is that with, with one footnote, most black and white digital images are in fact color files set to look like black and white. Uh, so in any sense, so, so, you know, this leads, this leads to both technical and philosophic questions. The philosophic being, we live in a color world. These things are color files. Why present them monochromatically? Technically, monochrome, monochrome is a better term than black and white because as somebody in the chat box noted, a fair amount of my images are toned and you, the conversion programs from Photoshop to silver FX to whatever it is have boxes you check and you can put a tone in. Oh, I should, I should comment about uh, the, this one. Um, effort versus quality. Realistically, no pain. 
no gain. Um, your camera will turn it to black and white. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of programs will turn it to black and white easily. The Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom will turn it to black and white in one click of a button. Realistically, for me to get high-end processing in black and white, I first work through it in color, often with the understanding that I'm going to go to black and white, which means I can exaggerate the color to get the black and white conversion to have more to work with. That's an important thought. If I know, so let me restate it. If I know that I'm going to go to black and white in the end, when I first process the image to color, I will usually exaggerate the color so that I give my black and white conversion programs more options and choices to work with when I convert to black and white. This uh, is an, an image I've used for a long time as an example of uh, black and white conversion because it, the black and white version of this image, which I call the road less traveled, is one of my more iconic images. Here's what it looked like in um, Adobe Camera Raw. So you can see that when I processed it here to color, it always all that's already quite a bit brighter and more saturated than the color version of the image. And here's what the layer stack that made the black and white copy of this image look like. Okay, quite a lot of layers here, and um, I'll, we'll we'll go more into this kind of thing in a bit. But for now, I want to comment. I'll make three three comments. One is that you want to, when you do a black and white conversion, you want to keep a color layer at the bottom of your layer stack so that once you've archived this structure, you can always go back to the color version and see what it was if you want. Okay, and that then too, it's just a mechanical thing. It makes a lot of sense to carefully name your layers. That's a way of documenting what you've done so that you can get back there so you don't get confused between your layers. And if you wanna replicate what you've done, you can replicate it. Um, and three, part of the virtue of using layers and a layer mask is that you can pinpoint control whatever you want anywhere in a monochromatic conversion. Note that this picture shows the top layer here, which is a Nick Silver FX preset uh, monochromatic soft, I think, at a low opacity at 14% and not in normal blending mode. A layer stack can be thought of looking down on it like a pancake stack. If the top layer is 100% normal opacity, then that's all you see. But lower the opacity of the entire la uh, uh, layer and change the blending modes for the layer. And that will change what comes through as you do it. So here's the black and white version of that image. So let me just go back for a second. Here's where I, here's, oops, here's where I started. Here's the color version. And after passing through this layer stack, here's the black and white version. That's uh, a little bit more than I typically will do, but not, not incredibly out of line. So, so there is a fair amount of malice aforethought that goes into my black and white processing. I like to have some idea on pre-visualization when I start out doing it. I also like to put some uh, music on and, uh, just have at it basically and have fun with that. It's as, so as this slide here says, pre-visualization heads to photography, heads to post-production, and you need pre-visualization in both parts of the image, not just the uh, photography. This is autumn in the eucalyptus uh, forest 
in Tilden Park near where I live. This was the, during this uh, pandemic year where I've not been traveling so far afield. Once more, a processing that looks as much like an etching. And uh, in March of last year in Canyonlands, uh, I think this was 10 exposures of monochromatic HDR of this uh, old tree over a infinite view. Yosemite from the famous tunnel, tunnel view where Ansel Adams has his gold-plated footprints. This is a place on the uh, Utah-Arizona border called the wave. And again, what happens with a landscape like this is it becomes very abstract. And a bristlecone pine, an old tree. I use this image, which is the one I started out with in the presentation for the proposition that just because you have all the information doesn't mean you want to show it. So this looking up in Antelope Canyon, this was a bracketed exposure with I think seven or eight exposures. And I had full exposure information for the parts of it that are black now. But when I opened those up so that one could see them more, the way that the looking up is a ribbon of light with the rock faces got lost in the and the contrast got lost. So sometimes what you want to do in a black and white image is increase the contrast, not decrease it. The object is to have control so that it matches your vision with what you do. This is a night photograph in the Piazza San Marco in Venice. And uh, Again, with the fog doing nice diffusion and the heading back with the progression of the lights. Golden Gate Bridge, the trick here was to wait for a moment when the wave went and snap it right then. Falling down pier over in Port Richmond. <laughs> well, it's not exactly architectural, but it's Paris anyhow. Okay, so we all know that this is the uh, court in the Louvre Museum with the pyramid. Um, and here's the, uh, the, the Capitol building in Havana, which hardly ever used for its purpose, but it's like, it's like our House of Representatives, except, uh, this is, well, I'm not even gonna go there on that. I'm gonna instead gonna answer a question from Bob on, deciding how many exposures when I bracket, which is a great question. Okay, so there's a practical answer and a theoretical answer. The theoretical answer is you want to all values from light to dark. So using an exposure histogram, it's pretty easy to determine that. And you don't even really need the histogram. You can just look at the LCD. You want to make sure that the whites are rendered and the blacks are rendered. So if you started at all white and went by one EV intervals to all black, uh, you'd have it all. You'd end up throwing away some of those captures, but then, you know, as I like to say, film is so expensive. What's, once you have the camera on the tripod, what's the harm in overshooting? So theoretically, you wanna go from all white to all black. Uh, or almost all white to almost all black. And that, that really would do it. Um, and sometimes that's just what I do. I just look at it and see. Uh, but normally speaking, eight to 10 exposures will do that. Usually seven, some cases less than that. You know, after you do this for a while, you get experienced about what you're gonna actually use. And, you know, one of the things I try to uh, convey when I do workshops with people and we're actually exposing in the field is that our eyes and our brains are actually smarter than most of our cameras. Our camera really doesn't know what effect we want. Only we know that. And often what the automatic exposure gives you is not the exposure you want. So shooting in bracketed exposure sets um, is one way to make sure that you're going to have different options about what to use. For example, probably if you expose this image, this is in uh, Prague, if, if you expose this image and 
you'd either expose for the sky or the landscape. If you expose for the sky, the uh, churches in the foreground would be dark. If you expose for the churches, the sky would be blown out. So really here, what you'd really probably need are two or three exposures. You don't need the whole range, but as I say, film is so expensive. Let's also look at something else, how far the exposures are, should be separated. My practice is to bracket by one EV using shutter speeds. Um, the, um, the, keep in mind that if you are exposing raw, which is what I recommend, that each raw exposure has a great amount of exposure values contained in it. So one EV exposure set is going to have an awful lot of overlap, but that's okay because, you know, film is so expensive, ha <laughs> ha, meaning digital is not. So, you know, what's the harm once you have the camera on the tripod uh, in, in shooting more photos? Hi, Simone, are all my B&Ws done with exposure sets? No, only the good stuff. No, just kidding. Uh, Sometimes it's not practical. For example, the photograph I showed of the road less traveled, one of become one of my really widely printed and well-known images was just a, a single uh, grab shot, basically. So sometimes it's not practical. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, but I think the bulk of the images that I've done that I'm proud of were exposure sets on a tripod. It's not always possible depending what's on in motion. It's not always possible because uh, places don't like you to have a tripod. Uh, that's an interesting issue as to how many exposures you can do on a tripod before they tell you to go away with your tripod. It's in Europe inside churches, it seems completely arbitrary. Some places are very happy with it. Some places uh, don't like it at all. It's sometimes hard to say. And sometimes I like to ask people to do things. I'm not the kind of person who likes to be in anybody's face. I like to ask before I photograph people. I like to ask before I photograph things. But I'm afraid in the real world, sometimes that just isn't so very practical. And if you ask and uh, you'll probably be told no, but if you just go ahead and do it, it's better to apologize than to ask permission. And so, you know, you just have to do what is comfortable with that. This is a, um, this is in Santiago de Compostela in Galicia, Spain at the, uh, the, the city at the end of the Camino de Santiago and in a um, old, uh, nunnery that's been converted to a museum, you'll find one of the two known triple spiral stairs in the world. And this is looking up that triple spiral stair, which is an interesting thing. It's a pretty straight bracketed photo with the camera on the tripod looking straight up it. A fisheye view of the top of a barn a fisheye view of the inside of Chartres Cathedral. Here's a detail which I've always found amusing of a, they do this in um, the Transylvania section of Romania, namely they decorate the eaves of houses with basically air slits or windows that look like eyes. So it's a, a face and a roof. And, you know, I wouldn't see with a photo like this any any need to bracket. It's basically going to be a solid exposure. It's going to be a solid average exposure. Your camera's meter will do just fine. You don't want any detail within the windows anyhow. You want those to be black. So there's really would be no reason to bracket on something like this. I think what I'm trying to advocate is intelligent uh, photographic practice. In other words, start with the premise that you are smarter than your uh, than the computer in your camera. And from there, go to the idea that you can decide what style photography to do in a particular place. I mean, you know, sometimes if it's just too much to schlep around the tripod and all the camera and all the weight, well, of course I don't. I just thought I would include a brief uh, iPhone section in here because I, I really like doing 
monochromatic images on my iPhone. My go-to black and white conversion app is uh, Snapseed. I, I use some other apps as well, but but uh, Snapseed, which is from the developers of uh, of the uh, Silver FX program is really pretty good black and white conversion generally. What the iPhone is also good for is creating um, toned and pseudo antique images and also for taking images in places like this one from inside a bus in the rain, where you very likely are not going to have your whole camera out. Here's an image of a uh, church in uh, southern France and this is a, this is a beach with the water receding with my iPhone. I was just walking on the beach and said, okay, this is a pretty neat pattern. The Columbia River with clouds reflected in it. Uh, fence and shadows. So, you know, my iPhone is kind of my sketchbook, really. I, I use it to do things where I don't have my camera with me. So, This is a pond in Maine in early autumn. And I've been up until the pandemic year for quite a few years, I've been teaching a course every summer at Maine photo, toward the end of the summer at Maine Photographic Workshops in Rockport, Maine and Midcoast, Maine. And this, this was uh, taken while I was uh, teaching my course there. And, you know, the natural inclination in a setting like this, besides swatting away the mosquitoes, is to present it in color because obviously there's some gorgeous colors in this image. But I, I just said, it's very graphic and you will see the shapes of the trees more if you convert it to black and white. I think we have a section of water here. So water presents a wonderful subject at various shutter speeds for black and white. So using your shutter speed intelligently <coughs> is another aspect of photography as again, like that diagram I showed of pre-visualizing in photography, you wanna pre-visualize at the photography stage and you also wanna pre-visualize at the post-production stage. This is an approximately a 30 second exposure. I think it's exactly a 30 second exposure during an Atlantic storm on the Atlantic side of Monhegan Island off the coast of Maine and a 30 second exposure here on the Pacific, the badly named Pacific Ocean off Marin Headlands. Up in uh, the lost coast of California. So this was to get an exposure this long during the middle of the day, I used a neutral density filter on my camera to cut down the amount of light coming in to create on purpose this effect of uh, fogginess. A, a much faster shutter speed of the waves coming in like a lace curtain and capturing a wave in motion. This is a, you know, a high ISO image of uh, the sea at night, moonlight in the background there. And uh, interesting, you can do this, that with cameras these days, it, it leads to all kinds of possibilities. And I joke around a lot about, um, noise and images and grain. And my joke is that, you know, grain in film photography became fashionable in probably the 1960s. And before that, it really wasn't. People tried to avoid grain at all costs. And my joke is that people are going to go buy digital cameras from the, from the 2005 to 2010 vintage for their high noise signature in time. I, I don't know if that'll really happen, but the idea that noise is totally terrible is, is, not, is prob probably simplistic. So you can use noise as another creative effect or possibility, and you can even consider adding noise into an image in post-production if you want. This is a, this progression here is a bridge across the river Minho, which sits at the Spanish Portuguese border. And again, is on a, one of the uh, Caminos going into Camino de Santiago. And uh, it's a wild to have this be an open border that you just walk across this bridge because for hundreds of years, there were fortresses on opposite sides of this river. 
And here's a iPhone shot of this person hole cover with the clamshell of the Camino de Santiago and the same logo in a high resolution HDR image built into the side of the cathedral in Santiago. So sometimes what I really look for in my black and white is simplicity like this garden bench and the um, Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Garden in Seal Harbor, Maine. And the other thing I recommend is I didn't go into uh, the, this beautiful garden expecting to photograph a bench or a wall. I was going there expecting to photograph the garden and the flowers and so on. Although this is an eclectic, uh, romantic, uh, pseudo oriental garden, certainly it's quite, quite extraordinary. But um, look around you, be open to what the possibilities are. All right, so two weeks from now, um, we are having another session, which is going to focus on special effects once you've already got an image in black and white. Uh, toning, tinting, um, the borders that you might put around it, um, maybe solarization. Um, oh gosh, there are all kinds of things. So here are four assignments, if you choose to accept them. and it, and what I'm going to show some examples of them after this. So repetition is one of them. High key is another low key, old fashioned look. So those would be the four things. You can submit up to four images. It could be one of each, or you could have multiple ones of it. And as I said, if we don't get to everybody's images today, we'll, we'll also do them next time. Okay, so here's repetition. See how the arches and the bridge echo, and there's there are like five kinds of repetition in this image. Uh, I just pulled five out of a hat, but there probably are more. There are the sort of black, black embrasures in it, the round progression of circles, the reflections coming up and coming down, and here's uh, the image in bigger size. Uh, another. Uh, Another progression, this is the Alte Bridge, the old bridge in Heidelberg, Germany. The last one was the Pont Valentre in Cohor, France. This is the Pont Neuf, the so-called new bridge in Toulouse, France, new being 1700s, I think. And again, you can see both the repetition here and progression. This garden is uh, called Schleppinghurst in coastal Maine. It was a converted quarry that it's one person's uh, devotion of love over many, many years. But, and so he arranges things like these smaller rocks on the bigger rock, but it's a great example of repetition. And his uh, shingle work and the buildings that he built there by hand are also examples of repetition. This train bridge is another piece of architectural repetition. Beneath the Berkeley Municipal Pier, you can see the repetition going down to infinity at the end here. These trees and the Marconi Grove on Point Reyes and Point Reyes National Park are another kind of repetition. This is the Madeleine in Paris, and you can see how the pillars repeat. You wouldn't know that they don't repeat forever except for the column heads you see on the upper right. So obviously the framing of this was part of the point of the image to just have a little bit of relief from the repetition. So when you think about repetition, also think about relief from the repetition. In this image from a hotel bedroom, um, the relief from the repetition is controlled by focus so that the balconies in the back end are out of focus, but the ones in the front end are in focus. A uh, factory siding in Spain with a stair going up and down. Reflections in San Francisco with uh, plenty of repetition. And uh, here we have repetition with the modern building and the older buildings in the reflection with a couple of different kinds of reflection that are repeated as the motif of the thing.
This is the causeway out to Bailey Island in uh, coastal Maine near Brunswick. And there's a special name for this kind of bridge, which is created just by laying uh, granite um, uh, on, t on top of it. So the tide flows through it, but it's structurally sound. So the repetition of the granite points is uh, um, um, the point of this photo. Uh, I see a pet, uh, question from Richard about uh, printmaking. And let me ask Phyllis, if I don't remember, could you remind me when we get to a, a, a Q and A session? It's, it's sort of uh, a whole topic into itself. Let me let me leave that for a little bit. But thank you for the question, Richard. This is a uh, pandemic image in the sense that I just made it, and. Uh, it's on the UC Berkeley campus. This is a bike rack. And so, of course, I had to get down into the bike rack to make it. Part of the fun of being a photographer is you get to do weird things that you probably wouldn't do as a respectable adult otherwise. Uh, but anyhow, the thing is that it's not, wouldn't have been makeable with uh, students around, everyone around anchoring their bikes to this thing. And again, it's the repetition is what makes it an interesting image. And uh, in the Mission San Francisco, the old church in San Francisco, here's a pattern of light and shadow coming through. It's a fun house in Prague, repetition. And uh, another kind of repetition involves repeating elements in Photoshop. So this is a repetitive Escher-like staircase here repeated in a lot of different ways. And this Nautilus shell of mine is repeated here in a lot of different ways. And another kind of repetition. This heart here in time for uh, Valentine's Day is uh, repeated. And the staircases here are repeated. Okay, high key. High key means a predominantly white or very light photo. Nothing too much more than that. These days, this one is my recent uh, favorite high key image because really it consists of the railway bridge across the San Francisco Bay with the center of the bridge open. It's not really an active railway bridge anymore, but it was the first uh, train going to San Francisco went over that bridge. Anyhow, uh, so when they first opened the Union Pacific across the country, it went across that. But photographically, the visual and technical control here is taking the detail in the sky and the sea and, and the bay and making those light while leaving the railway bridge so that it has definition. Yeah, Richard, this answer to that second question is yes. Uh, exactly. In other words, this is a uh, image in the uh, in San Francisco Bay, though it has a more exotic look than that. And I like to point out that this is a night photography image, a high key night photography image taken by moonlight at about midnight. And you know that it's a night image if you look carefully at the um, running uh, lights of the boat back behind it, which are on, which means that it's at night. Jim, uh, this is Jim Migley and hi, Jim, how are you doing? Can you clarify your question, please? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, would I select the lightest and darkest exposures for HDR combo to get this key effect? You're talking about this image, I think, perhaps. And well, uh, yes, but this is Bob Shankoff. Uh, James, Jim, yes, the answer is exactly yes. But the problem is that if you do that, you're gonna get a hell of a lot of contrast. And sometimes that leads to echoing lines between. So as a technical matter, sometimes it works better to do blending rather than just take the darkest and the lightest, unless you're very, very good at paint, painting layer 
uh, matches. But I have a couple of examples of this kind of thing when we get to the example sessions, and I think that'll that'll help give an idea about it. Yes, with this image, this panoramic of this bridge, I processed it intentionally to go high key toward the right. So that would be involve layers. And this is Turtle Tower in the middle of the central lake in Hanoi, Vietnam, a high key image in the fog here. And uh, well, is what it is. But Jim, yes, essentially a darker background image for the background and a different one for the foreground for the light and dark part. But but sometimes it takes a little bit more than that, is I guess, I guess my point. So Loki image is mostly black. Here are the foothills below Mount Diablo in California. And the point here really was the blackness of the foreground image lightening up as it as it went out. This is a black sand beach on the lost coast of California, basically a very low key image where the light comes from the line of surf and the light behind the uh, coastal range in the background. And we'll look at this image in the examples, but uh, here, here you have uh, a basically low key image of the dunes with the light coming in in the background there. Same thing here, but the light is the surf coming up from the wave. <laughs> yeah, well, again, the pattern here, this is a ship uh, smokestack with the pattern being the dark and the light here. And this is a low key image of the sun setting from behind the famous Bixby Bridge on the Big Sur coast. And from within, uh, <laughs> From 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 within the uh, this cave, the basically you expect. I mean, it's a funny thing, you know. If you take a night photography image and you expose it long enough so that everything looks natural, then it's not really going to look like a night photography to people. And the same thing's true within a cave like this photograph from Son Dong Cave in Vietnam. So part of what you have to do with this kind of photography is make at least part of the image low key. And this is inside a barn with the light coming through the door and the shadow lines. This is uh, on the Reichenau Causeway to the famous Reichenau Abbey in uh, Lake Constance on the Swiss uh, and German border. And here the point of this image, which is really a large scale set of hills, maybe 500 feet for each of the dips you see there is the contrast between the shadow and the white hills coming down. This is a, essentially a low key image, this workbench from the Russian uh, Fort Ross in California, about as far south as the Russians ever got in California, or at least so far, and uh, processed not to look like a photo so much, but very definitely a low key image. And this here's a, a night photograph, a low key image. And this is Bixby Bridge from the other side, a 30 second exposure on a foggy night. <laughs> if you can read this text, you're probably too close to it. I think it says old fashioned. So here are a few old fashioned effects. This one, primarily it's the border on the Pont de Lentre um, that creates the old fashioned aspect. And actually, um, Nick Silver FX is very good on borders as is the on one uh, filter set as well. This one is uh, sepia toned. That's the old fashioned aspect here from Yosemite. And more sepia toning here from this old car. And a couple of different effects here. The what's what you can really see on screen is the sepia that's Brandenburg Gate in Berlin in the background. What is a little harder to see and without a physical print is that I've painted in a few of the color, I've hand painted in a few of the color details here, particularly car tail lights and headlights. So I, I don't think I can really show that easily here, but there, so this is an example, both of sepia tinting 
and hand painting. Ron, I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's a longer story than that, but one way you can make things not exactly look like photographs is to use some of the uh, filters like from Topaz, for example, the Buzz Sim filter set and in, in Topaz Simplify and Topaz Studio. And the trick there is to not use them too much because something that make, looks painterly in at about 30% opacity can look terrible at 100% opacity. So I don't want people looking at my images and saying, oh, what is this? But I do want to add an element of painterliness to them when I can. So I, I add layers and paint over an image. And we'll, we'll take a look at some examples of this, particularly next time where we're looking at special effects. This is uh, St. Ursula Street in the gut of Valletta, Malta, so-called gut. And this is um, lightly sepia-toned Corleone in Sicily and made famous by the Godfather series, of course, to which I don't, I don't think the residents in this town are terribly happy about that. Here's a different kind of old fashioned in that the, these are the flywheels that run uh, San Francisco's cable cars and the cable car museum. And once it's okay to visit San Francisco again and go indoors, this is a great place to photograph. It's open to the public and no, no restrictions. The, what I I process this to look like um, basically a sort of um, in, in, in new industrial kind of thing, very kind of light and it's a little hard to describe styles, but there you go. And the gargoyle from Notre Dame with Sensel piece in the background is very much a kind of moody older look to it it's not a not a modern look this is a a murmuration of birds on the uh in the somewhere somewhere in the sacramento delta and the effect of the whole thing with the border is another kind it's almost like a snapshot that's right connie you're exactly right it is my thought was something like Met fritz lang's metropolis and that's so in those days, in the 1920s, that was extreme modernism. So it's a kind of retro modernism now. I mean, the, the, in some ways, the technical how is actually less important, but it's less interesting than the conception. And you get a conception of an antique look uh, by exposure to various visual mediums. Yeah, here, this is almost like a gravure, this landscape near near Point Reyes in uh, uh, Bolinas, California. And this is a simulated pinhole effect here. Or a faded Polaroid mark, you're exactly right. And here the trick is the border, the sort of ragged edge border and the sepia look of this row of uh, trees in Tuscany with the little hay bales down partway down the road on the right. Same kind of effect here in Tilden Park with the dancing trees. An image like this, it's very clear why you prefer to say monochrome um, the, um, rather than black and white because obviously it's not black and white, it's sepia and white or something. Uh, Richard, I feel I work from each image from the ground up. And I do for each image what, what, it, what it feels it needs. The question was, do you make your own custom presets and use them or you, do you prefer to work each image from the ground up? 
do you use pre-made presets much? It's a great question. Um, I, I, that said, of course, one falls into habits quite a bit. And, you know, I have habits of what I do. And what I do is I use a lot of the presets that exist either in Photoshop or in Nick Silver FX or on one and or whatever. And I combine them using a layer stack like the layer stack I showed in various different ways. That's, you know, it's certainly possible to look at presets and say, let's modify this and make your own. Or even as uh, I heard one, one great photographer say, what I do is I examine the presets, I understand what they're after, and then I build my own. You can do that too. I, I, what I tend to do is I tend to use a given preset on a portion of an image or at a partial opacity and keep going from there. And I play with things. So creative black and white opportunities, get it right in the camera if you can. And that's not a moral issue. I, I don't care morally speaking, whether it's done in a camera or in Photoshop, but if I can do it in the camera, it's gonna save me time. And in photography, there are all kinds of things. There's in camera motion, there's high key. We've looked at a bunch of effects. There's how you deal with water post-production. And these are some things we'll have a look at next time, include effects like solarization, Blossfeld effect, and so on. And this is the discount code for the, my black and white book. And here's how to get hold of me. And We'll take a few questions if there are some, and then we'll move on to some examples. Um, Bob, is it sacrilegious? There is no sacrilege in this field. The proof of the pudding is exactly what works. I mean, you know, I, the, um, if, if, I'm not sure what Ac what Acros is, but if you can put that in in Lightroom and build off that, you know, more power to you. That's great. Now there was a question a ways back about printing. Let me see if I can uh, see exactly what it was. I um, have it right here, Harold. Ah, being a Moab master, are there certain Moab papers you like to use for printing black and white, or other brands and types of papers also? Well, I think the Moab papers are great. Um, Juniper is one of my go-tos for black and white. It's really a great paper and really very photographic. You, <clears throat> you actually can sniff it and imagine you're in the dark room and has a, it really has a developer smell about it. Um, the metallic paper to a uh, pearl uh, is for high, high dynamic range black and white images has a very, very cool look, although it's a bit on the shiny side. The, um, any, any other papers you would add to that, Phyllis? Well, uh, for very special uh, applications, I would think the Slick Rock Silver also. It's very silvery, but it does have a blue cast to it. Right, and, and that's kind of antique, like in that portfolio we did of, of Paris iPhone images. Those right. are de definitely intentionally kind of antique looking. And on the matte side for matte papers, because those are all photographic glossy type papers or, or, you know, with a little shine to them. On the matte side, I would say something like, you know, their Somerset, their Entrada, their- um, The Entrada rag is a beautiful It's paper. beautiful. And they come in like a bright version with optical brighteners or a natural ber version that's more creamy looking. So For something have... that's sepia on, on the natural version. Correct. If, if, you, if you aren't after a real photographic effect, that is just a beautiful, beautiful look. I mean, you have to pre-visualize printing as well as as well as photographing and processing. And you know, you can pre-visualize in an experiment and go back and do something else. But uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's really a pretty a great set of papers there. That said, you know, someone, you know, uh, I'll I'll experiment with other papers too. I mean, nothing nothing that in terms of my wonderful arrangement with Moab says I can't. Uh, I can't um, 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 play by around others with, too, by, right? By others too, 
Um, um, oh, also, yeah, yes, we're about to go to some examples. Right, and I was just going to say also for uh, papers which are very interesting to try is the uh, Kozo Washi, because you know it has to be a certain kind of black and white image, but it can work really well on that. Mark, uh, you might want to take a look at the webinar recording that we did with Moab and a couple of other Moab masters on printing and papers. Also, I'll put the uh, Moab link in the chat box because they have a lot of uh, information on their website about printing and papers and things like that. So um, let's see, Larry, when you're in Photoshop and take a photo into Nick FX, does it come back into Photoshop as a separate layer? That's a great, um, that's a great question, a very, a very technical one. What it turns out that, I mean, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is that there are two ways to go about it. And, um, and Phyllis, when you get a chance, if you would put up the link to the webinar that we did on uh, printing and papers, that'd be great too. Um, so it, you set the preferences in NIC and you tell it to operate on a separate layer, uh, to, to create a separate layer or not. If you tell it to create a separate layer, then it will come in as a separate layer. What I prefer to do is to uh, duplicate my layer and then work on a duplicate layer. But it's same difference really. Either way you do it, you want to do something like Nick on a, on a separate layer in Photoshop. Um, Sean, do I use luminosity masks? Not so much, but I use LAB color techniques a great deal. And we have some webinar recordings up on how, how to go about that and what that looks like. And next time I'm gonna to try to include a uh, LAB black and white inversion as one of, the, uh, one of the examples. Okay, let me move on to show some examples since time is uh, short and of the essence. Okay, so we have here a sand dune exposure ISO 320, uh, 1 250th of a second, F25, 26 millimeter handheld, um, aperture priority metering with the exposure compensation set to minus one. Figured it was so bright there, or at least that thing of uh, light up at the upper right was so bright that I needed to, uh, I, that I, well, the wind was blowing like crazy on the side of the dune. No way was I, was I taking the tripod off my back, pulling the camera out and putting on it. It was all I could do to get the camera out for a second to make this picture. Um, so, so this is kind of an unusual exposure situation. I also wanted maximum depth of field so that the foreground would be in focus and the back. But looking at this as a black and white image, what I really want to do is go low key on it with a sort of stab of light over it. So here's how I would go about this. So I'm now opening up this up in um, camera, Adobe Camera Raw. And I'm going to make two exposures here through Adobe Camera Raw. One for um, one for the black foreground and one for the right at the top. So for the right at the top, I'm going to boost my exposure like this. And I'm not going to worry too much about anything else since I know I'm going to go to black and white. Okay, so we, we have here a, um, a bright image. Now I'm gonna make a darker exposure of the same thing. So, let 
mostly I'm just, I might be playing a little bit more with this in reality, but here we are. And we have now we have a darker exposure and a lighter exposure in Photoshop. Now, so that we don't go totally crazy here, I don't, I'm going to put down the resolution of these so that, and when I say totally crazy, I mean processing things over Zoom can take a huge amount of time. So, so I'm going to put them into 8 bit instead of 16 bit. And I'm going to take my image size down from 300 to 100. And Harold, you wouldn't usually do this. This is just for no. the webinar, right? Absolutely. In fact, I would, I feel very bad about mutilating these images, but how else are we going to, are we going to actually see anything without spending a lot of time? Um, watching our dial, right? Right. So, okay. So on this one, I also need to put the mode down to 8-bit and I also need to put the image size down. I thought it important to show this coming from the beginning though, rather than just presenting a knockdown version, which is what I would usually do. Okay, so what? here's my plan, my pre-visualization of this image. I, I'm first of all, first of all, it's clearly a good choice for a monochromatic image because it's mostly black and white anyhow. There's not a lot of color in this thing. I did present this image, by the way, in the slideshow you just saw. So you've seen a finished version of it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the black and white, the black version, put it over the light version and mask it in twice. Okay. And I'm going to mask it in so that um, the, the lower left portion of the image gets a lot darker and also so that the upper right portion of the image get, gets a lot darker. So the point of this image is going to be the contrast between the light streak going across it and the, um, and the black and the white. Oops, I missed. <laughs> okay, so, so the technique I'm using is I have the move tool selected, I hold the shift key down, I move over the target and I lift the uh, mouse up and then I lift the shift key up. So this image on top, I'm just calling dark so I don't go totally crazy. And then I'm going to put a layer mask on it, layer mask, hide all. And then I'm going to draw in a gradient here like this going from dark to light like that. Uh, that's not quite what I wanted. So let me go back and do it again. I want something more like this. Okay. So that puts dark there. Now, I'm going to duplicate my dark layer, layer, duplicate layer, like that. I'm going to take off the layer mask here, delete it. I'm going to put another layer, layer mask, hide all. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a very short gradient here to make the top part of this thing dark. Nope, not quite right, but basic idea. Yeah, that's about it. So everybody see that? Let, let me just make it a little bigger and let me close down this black version. Okay, here's where we came in. This is more or less the out of the box image. Here's with a dark layer here. Here's with the dark up in the sky. Okay, any questions about this before I move on? 
All right, so what I would do next here is I will, I, in real life, I would archive this, this color version of the image. And then I would, by archive, I mean save. So I would go save, okay? Then I would layer it down, I'd flatten my image. Then I'd go save as, okay? to save a sequence of images here. And here's where I would do a black and white conversion. And let's keep this one pretty simple, okay? So as I said, you leave the color in the background go, and I layer, duplicate layer. And let me use a silver FX on this. And I will, from my bottom layer, I'll just use the neutral silver FX setting. By the way, in terms of how you set it to uh, work on a work on a new layer or just do it on the own, that's in settings, and um, and that's the after clicking OK. I have it set to apply the filtered effect to the current layer. That's because that's because I already duplicated my layer. There was a question about that earlier. So this is neutral. And I'm just going to do, I'd like to get a little more resolution in the lower left portion of this image. So what I'm going to do is I go back to my background layer, I go layer, duplicate layer like that, bring it up to the top of my layer stack. I'm going to go back to Nick. And this time I'm going to go high structure. And I'm also going to lighten it up a little like that, and I'm going to increase my contrast. So I'll call it high structure. And I'm going to hide my layer, I'm going to take a nice brush, I'm going to put my brush up to really high opacity almost all the way. And I'm going to make it bigger so it doesn't get kind of smushy. Oh, that's about right. And then let's paint in some of this like that. And here is my is my layers. Okay, here's my layers panel. So, so far, what we have, we started with this uh, color version, which was already a combination of a dark and a light. I added a neutral black and white processing from Nick. This is an all Nick conversion here. And then I added high contrast to here. And everything here is pretty good. I like it pretty much, but I want to make it a little bit lighter here. So I'm going to duplicate my um, my uh, high structure layer. I'm going to take my layer mask off and I'm going to put the duplicate layer into screen blending mode. And I'm going to put a layer mask on it, layer mask, hide all, and I'm going to paint in a little bit more here. And this is pretty much how that image came out. It's pretty much the process. Let me make it bigger. And let me run through the layers. Here's the neutral black and white process. Here's a high structure masked in. And here's a high structure copy for the bottom. Um, 
questions on this before we move on to another example? Uh, we've had a question about whether the webinar will be recorded. And yes, we record all of Harold's webinars and they all go up on YouTube in a little bit for free to watch again. And for those who can't join us today because of whatever reason. So they're up there and waiting for everyone. So this one, this, this example here started with one capture and it shows a pretty typical scenario for black and white conversion, e.g. you want to up the contrast but process both contrasted regions in a, in a naturalistic kind of way. This is very, very, very typical. This kind of thing comes up um, pretty often. Let's have another, let's look at another example. It, but when I shut this, I haven't saved anything. So if anyone has any questions about it, speak now or forever hold your peace or something or hold your water glass. Okay, now you ask me. Just kidding. Um, here, let's do this one. This is basically another classic example of the same thing. Okay, so what I want to do here is I want to do one for the sky and one for the foreground. You saw a black and white version of this image in the slideshow. Um, so let's do the sky first. It's going to up the contrast, make it darker, lower whites, yeah, something like that. Maybe add a little saturation into it since I know that this is going to black and white. Anyhow, I don't really care about the color very much. We're um, more, okay. Okay, so let's uh, call this guy. And let's take down the uh, bit depth and resolution here for ease of processing. As Phyllis is going to make me point out, this is not something I would do normally. Okay. So let's do another one for the foreground. And here, what we want to do is make the make a lot of visibility in the road. I'm upping the exposure value for the bottom by two EVs. And um, that should basically do it. I don't really need to do anything else. Okay, let me take the uh, specs down on this thing. And so we'll call this Earth. We'll put a layer mask over it. We'll do a gradient from white to black from starting something like that. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, here's where we started with a darker high contrast version for the sky. Here's where we added in uh, earth exposed pretty you know, upped by about two EV, but but the contrast uh, not affected. Any questions about this? 
Okay, well, that's more or less, I mean, from here on, it's really a pretty straightforward black and white conversion. Flatten the, I would save it, you flatten it, you give it a new name, you can duplicate your layer, and let's let's do the sky here with a uh, with a Photoshop adjustment. And this, these are the black and white adjustments. And what often is great with clouds is their high high contrast red preset like that. Okay, so I'm going to. Um, I'm going to I'm going to merge that down and this is a high contrast red and let's duplicate a la the layer for the bottom and we'll put for the bottom we'll use that same high structure nick preset layer duplicate layer move it up to the top uh, filter Nick Silver FX Pro. And we'll use the, well, you know, you can look through them. That's I, okay for now. I'm going to do, I'm going to do that one. I'm feeling naughty today. High contrast, harsh. And high contrast harsh, I'm going to put a layer mask on, layer mask, hide all, a gradient tool from bottom to top, like that. And then let's paint in a bit more in the sky. Uh, I'm going to take down the opacity of my brush to about 50%. Okay, it's pretty much it. I mean, I might refine this a bit, but this is pretty much the the idea of how I made this image. Uh, let me just take it apart for a second. Now I, I omitted a step, which is to put some, a neutral black and white over the top of the color, just for the sake of workflow. Um, high contrast red for the clouds, high contrast harsh for the bottom. Remember, there were two different exposures of this combined in the color versions. Questions about this? Speak now. Yeah, I mean, sure you, sure, uh, well, can you use the similar effect? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, I mean, the, Nick, Nick is pretty good, but as you can see, I used high contrast red down here, but I, I could have used something else for the bottom. It didn't have to be Nick. Let me, let me delete this layer and let me duplicate my background. Layer, duplicate layer. I mean, if you're really interested in black and white, I would say that uh, silver effects is probably worth the investment, but no, you don't have to use it. And so for the bottom, let's see what uh, maximum black as a preset looks like. Well, let's see. Um, uh, oh, I like that. That's, that's the IR adjustment. That's nice. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge down my layer. I'll say what it is, which is IR, pseudo IR. I'll put a layer mask on, layer, layer mask, hide all. And this is a Nicholas conversion. This is just using Photoshop black and white adjustments. Um, the key point here is that is not so much which filter you use, but that um, but that you can control which parts of it are converted and how they're converted. 
uh, Bob, in terms of using Lightroom, the closest you can get to this are the Lightroom adjustments, and you're probably better off doing that while it's still in color before you go to black and white. You know, remember that the first steps in this conversion were to, uh, here, if I go back, were to, um, were to um, go here, right? So, so you can use the tool, there's a brush tool and a gradient adjustment in Lightroom that you can do to do, use to do that. What you cannot do in Lightroom is layers. And for pinpoint processing, you've got to have layers. Sorry. I mean, you know, I, there's just no way around it. Um, so it's easy to learn to use layers for this kind of processing. This is not rocket science. And I really do recommend, even if you do the bulk of your work in Lightroom, I really do recommend a, 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 a trip into Photoshop for, for working with layers. Any further questions? Hey, Harold, okay. uh, Ron has a comment. He says, Nick just had a webinar on SilverFX Pro 2. And the replay is available on their site. The second part is coming up next week. Ron, any good? <laughs> Apparently it's probably good or he wouldn't have recommended it, right? <laughs> Maybe. All right. And uh, Photoshop also has a free trial for 30 days if you want to try it. Yeah, but I assume if he is Lightroom, he's probably at least doing the uh, Creative Cloud Photographers pack. So he probably right. he probably has access to Photoshop. It's uh, it's fear of Photoshop, and and uh, we must overcome it. I've played with it; it makes me cry. <laughs> oh, poor Bob! <laughs> Why don't you put our Photoshop Darkroom book oh, in the, for him? Bob, yeah, check this. It. Check this out. Most people say that after they've done this, they can do basic layer photographic processing without too much problem. It makes me cry. Oh God. We, <laughs> people. Oh. Well, some yeah. of these things make me cry too. I mean, um, you know, I mean, you know, you're a part of Photoshop. I know my part. If I had to do your part, I'd cry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see, which one are we going to do now? Um, ah, well, Phyllis, would you rather be in Paris or Canyonlands? Um, I don't know, both sound nice. I think we really have time for one more uh, before we move on to look at some uh, images. How about Paris? Okay, let's do Paris. I kind of agree. Um, Connie said Canyonlands. Well, <laughs> well, Connie, there we go. She'll, let's go to Canyonlands then. No, no, let's do Paris. <laughs> we'll do Canyonlands next time. Uh, uh, Lightroom color separation tool. I think I think you're talking about what in Photoshop is the uh, channels panel. It's my my guess. Oh, Ron says second Canyonlands, Harold. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. So with this image, this is a this is a, this is a, this is a multi shot of this tree. Um, <laughs> You've been outvoted, Harold. <laughs> apparently, I, I I I thought we'd run through the raw files as shots, so you can see them. But I've prepared low resolution versions of each of them. So we don't have to sit through doing the low resolution versions. It's quite a beautiful, beautiful spot on uh, up an island in the sky and canyon lens. And uh, there I was in March. Uh, <laughs> well, you can't win here. Maybe we'll do both. Uh, the And, uh, you know, the idea that we'd be what well, you never anyhow. Uh, so this is, these are all uh, 15 millimeter um, F29 ISO 64. This was tripod mounted, obviously. This is six seconds, three seconds, 1.6 seconds, eight seconds, five seconds, not quite a, a one EV, uh, 
a quarter of a second, an eighth of a second, a fifteenth of a second, a thirtieth of a second, and I think that's it. Okay. So all I did when I when I converted these is I um, I just took the bit depth and the resolution down the way you saw in the other files. I just figured we didn't want to have to sit through doing that. Um, and here they are, and I'm going to run these through Nick HDR FX Pro. Hope that doesn't take forever, even at low resolution. And by the way, you don't have to have Nick HDR FX Pro. You, the, the Lightroom HDR is perfectly good, as is the Photoshop ones, and they all work more or less the same way. Um, which is that they you run it through and they give you presets. So fundamentally, what I think I would do or did here with this, we can count them up, but I think there are 10 exposures here going from dark, dark to light, light. And um, fundamentally, what I think I'm going to do here is I'm going to go and do a basic monochrome preset and see what that looks like. And probably that'll be good enough. Note that for the most part, I don't try to deal with alignment or ghost reduction. Most of the alignment I don't need help with because the camera was on a tripod. So I click Create HDR here. And it's merging the exposures. Oh, it's actually really pretty good looking. Let's see what the monochromatic ones look like. Okay, so here's one of them that's realistic. I think I'd like it a little lighter than that, but otherwise that's fine. And here's the artistic. Well, actually, eh, I think the realistic is better, but I think it should be a little lighter. So, um, Oh, that's just fine. It's putting me out of a job, right, Phyllis? Um, what I can also do is I can use one of their control points to lighten up the exposure on the tree while keeping the sky black. So here's a control point. So what I'm doing with this is within the radius of the circle, I'm lightening the exposure by whatever percent this is by about by about uh, 30 30 percent by about a third, and I click OK. Hey Harold, Sean has a question. It's worth trying, Sean. It's, it's sometimes sometimes you can get different. Uh, different values that way. I mean, just like with a single exposure, there's it, it's worth doing different conversions either in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw and blending them, which is what I showed on the first two examples. So yes, it's worth trying. Um, Harold, I'll just read the question since yeah. everybody can't see it. Okay. Uh, Sean asked, if you only have a single exposure, is there any value in creating alternate versions in Lightroom? with different exposure values and then doing an HDR merge. Yeah, again, yes. it's worth, it's, yes, it's worth trying. I can't promise that the results will be good, but consider that the first two examples, I was essentially doing that in Photoshop. So yes, you've got all these exposure values hidden inside your single raw file. And one way to look at them is to do what you called a faux HDR, F-A-U-X. So, let me move on to the Paris example. And. Oh, you mean we get both, Harold? That's what I figured, why not? <laughs> and we'll do that somewhat differently. So the 35 millimeter F16 ISO 64 on a tripod. Um, one fifth of a second, a 10th of a second, a 20th of a second, 
a 40th of a second, an 80th of a second. And I don't know why these aren't showing, but they're not. It's, it's one one sixtieth of a second and one three twentieth of a second. I honestly don't see this one as being much use to me. Um, but, you know, film is so expensive. What I really would want to do here is simply combine one for the foreground with one for the clouds. That's all. So I don't really need to go to all the uh, rigmarole, but I did do a, I did do knockdown versions of these. So let's take this one for the foreground. This incidentally is a view of Paris from the Montmartre Hill where last time I was there, I stayed with the idea of renting a garret room with a great window out over Paris from the this somewhat unusual angle. You can see, uh, um, well, there's uh, Les Enfants, uh, Napoleon's tomb over there. This is the Eiffel Tower and so on from, as I say, from a somewhat, there's Madeleine from a somewhat different angle. Okay, so let's use this one for the clouds. Okay, and layer, layer mask, hide all, and okay. Any questions about that? So let me, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of this. Again, here, what you would do is save it and flatten image. And um, layer, duplicate layer. I'll use one of the presets from on one on this one for variety's sake. Wow is really right about this. I mean, it's, it's amazing that something that is so um, easy is has so much power. And Ron asks, how do you decide where you put the gradient? <laughs> um, oops, whatever this thing is doing. Care, carefully would be the uh, trial and error. <laughs> no, no. I mean, honestly, honestly, there's more to be said about it. Um, by the way, the uh, border I have up there in from on one is a heck of a cool border that I use sometimes. Um, let's see. Go. Let me just find the filter I was looking for. You know, they have some nice old fashioned filters in here. Okay, that one they call grainy film. Here's fade to black. I'm looking for Ansel in the fields, which is a stupid name, but it's here somewhere. Um, filter. Hmm. Well, I don't see it, but. Well, I seem to remember it was in some other place like presets or something, not in the black and white. Oh, or that's something. quite possible. Thanks. Yeah, here we go. And let's make it a little, no, oh, it's actually darn good just as it is. Okay, you got, you got yourself a nice monochrome image there. Uh, Ron, yes, you got to experiment with it and get a feeling for it, but the general principle is you overshoot so you start a little, so you, so you start a little behind where you want to go and you go a little over. So if I were drawing the gradient here, I never would want to stop exactly at the horizon line, because if you stop exactly at the horizon line, it, it's going to create a noticeable bump. So you want to go past the horizon line. So the gradient that I had drawn on this one started from about, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but about a third of the way up and went about a third of the way into the sky. So, so the key thing to think about is overshooting. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll take one or two questions and then let's move on to look at some images because I think we got to have a lot of images to look at. And um, next time, two weeks from now, I will, I will be focusing on special techniques and I will work through more examples and most significantly anybody whose work we haven't got to this time will show uh, next week along with uh, uh, assignment work from the assignments we talked about this time. And uh, goodbye for now and hang in there, stay healthy, vaccinations are on the way. Hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. Be creative and stay mighty.